responsible. What we say is 40 years of doing the same thing that not only doesn't work, but that kills people, and especially young people, is irresponsible. These are policies that incarcerate their bodies and that lacerate their spirits. Let us not be ambiguous. We must end the drug war now. We must reform the drug policy that makes drug use criminal and gives criminals a multi-billion dollar business. We need to take that business out of their hands and regulate it and be able to control what happens in our communities. If we take the flow of money out of the hands of organized crime, we cut off their lifeline. We cut off their ability to recruit the young. We cut off their ability to buy the weapons that are hurting our youth. And we can end the drug war. Maybe we could even end it before that ignominious 100-year anniversary that former Mayor Ken Schmoke mentioned. We can build better communities and better nations and a way better binational relationship. We can do this only when we get together. We support our local organizations and we get together across borders. Then we can join together, not just to share our pain and our sorrow, but based on a common vision of a better future for ourselves and for our families. Thank you. Thank you all. Now we're going to have Jillian Maxwell address us. Thank you, Jillian. of this terrible drug war. I'm very honored to be here this afternoon, and I want to take, make the most of the short time that I have with you. So I have a question for you, and, and I want you to think of the first thing, remember the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear the question. It goes like this. What is your unique quality that you bring to your community here? What is your unique quality that you, inside of you, bring to your community here? It's very important to know who you are so that you can bring your unique quality to help this bad situation in Baltimore. Your city needs you. I'm Gillian Maxwell, and I'm here to tell you about my story of finding out who I was and how I was part of a group of concerned citizens who opened the first supervised injection site in North America, in Vancouver. This is a good story, I'm here to cheer you up. Um, a supervised injection site is a place where people go to do their drugs in safety. It reduces HIV and uh, uh, transmission, and it also reduces drug overdose deaths. As well, and for me more importantly, it's a place of refuge where people who are lost can go and just be themselves and feel accepted. I'd like to tell you this story in a way that's, I'm hoping, inspirational and also practical for you on your journey. I live in Strathcona. It's part of the downtown east side of Vancouver. My neighborhood, that's in Canada. Uh, just above Seattle. Uh, it's a great neighborhood with a long history and beautiful character houses and many, many marginalized people have lived there for years, far longer than I have lived there. I moved there in 1996. Many people were thinking of moving there too because they realized, as I did, 
What a great real estate investment it was. I had no idea what that decision, how that decision would change my life. So, here I am living in Strathcona, edgy neighborhood, and I'm really out of my comfort zone. I'm nervous and a little scared to go out at night by myself. I don't know. So what did I do? Well, I actually took a self-defense course and I learned how to defend myself. <laughs> After that, I wasn't quite so scared. And I started looking around and I noticed that the people in my neighborhood were ill. They were actually mentally and physically sick. And mostly the people they came into contact with were the police. Now it's the police job to keep the streets safe. So of course, for this group of people, it meant they weren't welcome on the streets where they lived. I was attending residents association meetings. Those people were scared too. They were scared that their stuff would be stolen. And they wanted, they wanted more police. I knew this wasn't the right answer, but I had nothing new to offer. Around that time, a group of injection drug users formed themselves into an organization called Vandu. Yes, yes Vandu. And they held a meeting in a big tent in a park. And people came from Germany, as people have been come from the Netherlands here to talk to you, came from Germany to tell us about this thing called harm reduction and how supervised injection sites saved lives. I am so excited to hear this. We finally had something we could do about this terrible problem. I became the president of the Residents Association. I couldn't wait to share this information. I called a meeting. I had experts come to talk. I was sure that they would just get it for my neighbors because this was a, it was a more kinder thing to do. It was less expensive and it had been proven to have worked well in, all, in many parts of Europe. So we're, here we are in this big meeting. I'm, I'm sure it's going to go well. My heart sank as I looked out to my group of neighbors and saw anger, actually. They hated the idea, and they kind of hated me too for introducing it to them. I became blacklisted in my community. I was called a traitor. Uh, people threw eggs at my house. Uh, somebody started a hate email campaign about me, and I was ostracized. Um, I learned from that experience how fear can overcome some people's humanity and compassion. As I go along with the next part, I just want to reference some um, best practices that we think are important that we learned. Number one is commitment. So, in the past, I may have backed down in the face of that kind of aggression, but you know, I just was, I was pissed off, and I just felt it was time for people to stand up for disempowered people. And, and I'm sure there are many, I know, there are many of you here today who have also taken a stand and have been subject to aggression. And all I can say is, that uh, an unwavering commitment is really, I think, one of the hardest things to do in order to make change happen. But honestly, it's the, one of the most important things to do. So, I was on fire by that point, and I longed to be in service, and I longed to be involved. So I found a bigger pond to play in. I joined the Community Health Committee, and while I was there, I met this guy called Bud Osborne. Bud Osborne is like the unofficial poet laureate of the downtown east side. I love him. And he, he um, writes poems all the time. And I want to share with you some words from, his, from a poem of his. Bear witness, not only to the drug overdose deaths, but to the uncounted deaths in the downtown east side. Deaths of drug addicts from suicide and AIDS. And so, we are all abandoned if one is abandoned. And so, we are all uncared for if one is not cared for. 
I was invited to join the Vancouver Police Board. Now that's the citizen oversight for the, the, the city police, small group of people working with the mayor of Vancouver. Me, I would never have dreamt that up, that that would happen. And uh, one of the um, principles of harm reduction is meeting people where they're at. And I put this to good use while working with the police. It's my experience that it goes a long way to um, meet people with curiosity and respect, um, particularly when you really don't agree with them. Um, during the three and a half years that I was on the Vancouver Police Board, Vancouver experienced a public health emergency because of an HIV epidemic. And all of those things that Bud talked about in the poem, they were happening six blocks from my house. This is in a city rated as one of the most expensive, beautiful, and livable cities in the world, but not for everyone. That level of commitment that I was discovering inside of myself, many others, many, many others in Vancouver had it too. And that resulted in us opening Insight, the first supervised injection site in Vancouver and North America in 2003. Now today, there isn't a mayor of Vancouver who could, who could not support it. And last year, in 2011, the Supreme Court of Canada sanctioned it officially. It's protected, it cannot be closed. Yes. Yeah. Number two, face-to-face -face contact. We realize the importance of uh, potential funders and supporters meeting the people whose services that they were going to receive. Because statistic people can be written off if they're just statistics. And it's really hard to judge and condemn somebody when you're sitting across from them face-to-face. Getting support. We found that you really have to have people at the top. And we had, we had some notable policy makers and politicians who were courageous and took a stand and willing to put themselves online. Like your Mayor Schmo and like Dan and Greg, your uh, state DA. Brave souls. Um, we also realize that it's really important to find out what those authority, people in authority want. For instance, after Insight was opened, the government wanted to close it down. They thought we were encouraging drug use. They wanted treatment. They wanted people to get off drugs. So we responded by building in the, upstairs from the injection site treatment and detox facilities. Now meeting their agenda actually approved the quality of services that we were providing. I call that teamwork. Number four, using story and media. We made sure that people of influence watched a powerful movie, a documentary called Fix, which was about the story, the lives of people who were injection drug users. We also made sure that they met people from a group called From Grief to Action, these were middle-class families whose kids were uh, in danger of dying of overdoses. One courageous mother spoke about her son, who was injecting in insight and looked at himself in the mirror and saw his reflection and just realized that he had to quit, he couldn't go on. Remember Vandu, the drug users group? They took a, a, this a constructive effort and they made 2,000 wooden crosses and they place them in this community park to illustrate how many people have been killed in a very short number of years. That's 2,000. We also make good relationships with the media and they love the story. We gave them media friendly stories and they really appreciated it and it ended up going viral. Yes. Measuring your success, number five. It's really important to know the before and after stats so you can say what's going on. And we were able to prove that we have reduced 
HIV occurrences. And deaths have been, um, overdose deaths have been reduced by, in the first two years in the vicinity around the site by 35%. Number six, working together. Now, working together is what works. And sometimes, it just totally sucks. Have you ever been in a meeting where everybody is fighting? Yeah. Have you been part of a group where everybody needs to be right? Or have they been paralyzed by fear? Well, what have, well, all I can say about that is that it's very easy to get distracted, but who wins if you do? The politicians. You're giving them every excuse to continue to not give a damn. We've all learned a lot. I've lost my innocence. I've learned that uh, change is a process and it requires perseverance and patience. Patience is my biggest challenge. And again, I'm Gillian Maxwell. This is a very distilled version of our 13 years. Oh, that's what I wanted to tell you. It took 13 years from, the thing, from that meeting in the tent to the Supreme Court um, uh, ruling. So, that's a distilled version of about 13 years. I'm going to be in the breakout session on community organizing. Please come and see me. I just want to get back to that first question that I asked you, which is what is inside of you that's your unique gift? It's so important to connect to that. And once you do, anything is possible. Martin Luther King Jr. said, almost always, the creative, dedicated minority has made the world better. I know all of you are that creative, dedicated minority, and I honor you. Thanks for listening. Population. But we make up 50% of the U.S. prison population. 50, 
three, maybe. Okay? To me, you know, it's not about crime. It's not about drugs. The war on drugs is just the, the most recent manifestation <laughs> of this very old war. Okay, it started as a war against the indigenous people, genocide, wipe them out, take their land, bring Africans here to do the work. <laughs> and in some cases, to teach Europeans how to do the work. Okay? Uh, you know, it's old, it's ongoing, and so we have to think broader than that. You know, I feel for the mamas. I'm a mother, and there but for the grace of God, you know, I haven't lost a child. I have four children. But in reality, I have more children than that. You know, and, and the reason being is because I'm responsible for those sons and daughters, and mostly sons in my case, because I work in, a male, in male prisons, whose parents caught that bullet, whether it was drugs, whether it was HIV, whether it was just coming to poverty and oppression. You know, I got out with just surface wounds. I'm recovering now. I haven't been clean for 20 some years or so. Don't just cry. It ain't about that. It's not about that. You know, because it's all too common in our communities. People are getting high for reasons. They're getting high to, to escape, you know, the pain of living in an oppressed community. There's a lot of pain in Baltimore. Matter of fact, you know, I look out here and I think about the fact that Baltimore is not here. We got to do a better job. We got to do a better job. Okay, it's not about to come in here. It's not about to come to activists and organizers. First of all, if you are an organizer, a significant amount of your time should be spent with the people affected by the issue that you're working on. So check this out. Okay? That's for real. All right? That's part of the problem. They all too often, I hear people giving kudos to the politicians. I don't give a damn about them. They've sat by while uh, children have had to go out and hustle for a living. Okay? All right? I like personal people who got it for real. But you know what? I'm not going to give up on props to anybody, especially a prosecutor. Okay? Because all those elements of the system have effectively kept us on lock for 40 years or more. Okay, you look at the 1970s, that's when you saw that boost, you know, in the U.S., the, the prison system becoming actually much more black. Prior to that time, it wasn't majority black or people of African descent. And, and, and on a political and a historical level, if you look at the system, there were two periods in this country where you saw that kind of increase in the prison system. Immediately upon the destruction of Reconstruction in the South, okay, you saw a growth and increase in U.S. prisons, okay, and immediately upon the destruction of the Black Liberation Movement, liberation movements that, that Native American people were attempting, okay, immediately upon that period and the deindustrialization of cities like Baltimore, you see this increase. You know, black folks, you know, giving Bill Clinton kudos at the Democratic Convention. More of us went to prison under this man than all the baby, baby Bush, his daddy, okay, <laughs> all of them combined. Bill Clinton made Richard Nixon, who was no friend of black folks, look progressive. Okay, because when he, the war on drugs, he there was initially much more money and emphasis on drug treatment. That gradually is dwindled. Okay, but, but to me it's bigger than that. It's bigger than policy, it's bigger than services. It's about holding hands of people in the community. It's about accompaniment. Okay, not just talking about these issues and patting ourselves on the back. It's about being there, being present. It's about providing opportunities for these young people. Everybody is hustling. First of all, you're making money. And everybody that's hustling don't necessarily want to do what they're doing. Okay? Our prisons are now filled with 14, 15, 16 year old children. That's a problem. It's a problem of conscience. Okay? It's a big problem of conscience. We can solve many of those problems in our community. Not just simply by putting money or funding or writing grants. 
okay? But actually putting like our collective money where our collective, or sometimes really uncollected mouths are. You know, making more commitment to create opportunity for folks. You know, it, it's, to me it's that simple. It's that simple. That's pretty much all I have to say. Um, just want to, once again, you know, say that I feel, and I can't imagine what you all are going through, but I feel empathy for you, for Javier, for everybody. I feel empathy for the mothers in Baltimore who keep losing their sons and daughters. Amen. We're going to keep on losing until we make some serious right. commitment to make a change, you know, in the communities that we live in. Thank you.
Um, there are a bunch of other things that a lot of people have already said, and typically when these conversations are had, many of us hear many of these things over and over again. So we all know.